gosh, I love it. You're watching Daytime presented by California Closets, designing better lives. Few actors are immediately associated with cool when you hear their name. But when I said that just now, a good chunk of you probably just went, well, Steve McQueen. Uh, but the driver of the iconic bullet Mustang had plenty of things in his life that made him human. And here with more is author of the new book, Steve McQueen, in his own words, Marshall Terrell. Hi, Marshall. Hey, how are you? I need you to do me a favor. I, in the last six months, and a lot of us are just faced inside with our demons all day, and we feel really insecure right now. So I need you to help us feel like Steve McQueen was human. What were the human things about Steve McQueen? Well, you know, you mentioned insecurity, and, and unfortunately, that was that was part of his DNA. You know, he grew up with uh, two alcoholic parents and a father who abandoned him, and a mother who didn't love him. So he felt terribly insecure growing up. Um, and but, however, uh, that all kind of flip flopped when he got to Hollywood, and everybody, I guess you would say, uh, kissed his ring. So it's an interesting dynamic in in how he was treated throughout his life. What was it about him that when he got to Hollywood, he could just all of a sudden be viewed as a cool dude? Well, you know, a lot of that was the fact that, you know, he drove cars. He, he did a lot of his own stunts. Um, he didn't really particularly give a whole lot of interviews. Um, he, you know, a lot of that, some of that was the basis of this book. Um, but, you know, he was one of those guys from the era where you don't complain and you don't explain. And so that's kind of what made him cool. So you mentioned you didn't do a lot of interviews, but if this book is called Steve McQueen in his own words, where are you getting all this from? Well, like I said, he did do some interviews in the, in the early portion of his career. Um, a lot of this comes from uh, raw Q&As that were never published, um, press releases, um, recorded interviews that were never published, um, and anecdotes that, uh, that were passed on down to me from his friends. Uh, for example, one of his, you know, one of his best friends, uh, Bud Eakins, uh, said that uh, when Steve McQueen uh, turned 40, he he, he was kind of like living recklessly, and uh, he said, "Steve, what's going on with you?" And he said, "Hey, my my mom died when she was 50, my dad died when he was 50, and I'm going to die when I'm 50. So I'm I've got 10 years to live it up." And so I never forgot that quote, um, and that's one of the quotes that's in the book. So it comes from a variety of sources, um, and uh, you know, a lot of 40 years of collecting. Well, that is pretty ominous to hear considering he did die at 50 in a, a weird way. Did he have asbestos poisoning? Yes, it, when he was in the when he was in the Marines, he went AWOL and and one of his punishments was that he had to clean the hull of the ship. And so that hull of the ship had a lot of asbestos and that's what he inhaled and and with the asbestos it usually takes 20 to 30 years to develop. And th that punishment, I, I looked up the military records. It took place in December of 1949, and he was um, diagnosed with cancer in December of 1979. So it was 30 years to the day almost. Well, everyone at home is now horrified about the fact that they could have asbestos poisoning and they won't know for another 15 years. <laughs> Uh, it's 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 a shame, but um, you know he uh, he did die young, but he, he in the process he did become a legend, and that's why you know we're still able to publish books on McQueen. Uh, there's a, and that's why there's this fascination with him. Well, one thing I learned from your book that I didn't know, and I would think would be uh, a bit of a problem if you have to memorize screenplays all the time, is that he was dyslexic. That's right. Yes, he had a lot of things going against him. He he was. Uh, partially deaf, uh, dyslexic, had a ninth grade education, so you can understand why uh, he would want to limit his dialogue because he couldn't really memorize things that well. Uh, but you know, for some reason that worked for him and people recognized that. So he didn't, he didn't have to say a whole lot of dialogue but, and he made up for it by giving you a look uh, that could speak volumes. And so that was really kind of his stock and trade. That's such an interesting thing that you're giving to us right now that perhaps his, what he's known for being very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Didn't talk a lot, very cool and just looked at you like you said. That actually didn't come from the fact that he just liked to do that. He actually had to do that, is what you're saying, because he was dyslexic. That's correct, yes. So I think laconic is the word that you were looking for. He didn't, he didn't have to say a whole lot. But, yeah, uh, I'm not, he was I'm not. the <laughs> guy to do that. 
I'm not an author, so I would not have thought of that word. I <laughs> would fail the GRE right now. I don't know words like that. Uh, real quick, while I have you, just as someone who is a historian of Steve McQueen, did you see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where he was depicted, the Quentin yeah. Tarantino movie? That, and that's absolutely my favorite movie of all time. Um, and McQueen was, he was, you know, he was given a very small role, but uh, the actor did a really, uh, uh, I think he portrayed him fairly well. And, uh, but, and it was nice to see Steve McQueen up there on the screen uh, getting his due. Ah, see, I had a problem with it because I thought that they made him off in the corner by himself sulking about Sharon Tate, and I thought that that was a little weird. That, was he like that? Was he kind of quiet at parties? Yes, yes, he was. You know, and, and, and he and Sharon Tate did have a, a relationship, so um, that scene had more truth than most people might know. My producer found on the internet that apparently he was supposed to be there that night that Sharon Tate was murdered, but he instead went to go hook up with another woman. Is that true? That's correct. The story goes is that he was on his way, um, and Steve McQueen was fond of picking up women on his motorcycle and on the way to the house. He, he found someone and found a hitchhiker, picked her up, and off they went. And, um, and then he found out the next day that they were murdered. So, yes, that, that's absolutely true. It's amazing how those things worked out for Steve McQueen, where his cool, short-worded just look came from being dyslexic, a problem turned into a solution that produced his career, and then his life got to be extended because he just wanted to go hook up with somebody. That's how cool Steve McQueen was. <laughs> uh, I like the way you think. I'm just, it's just cause and effect. That's all it is, and that's why this book is going to be fascinating to read. It's called Steve McQueen in His Own Words, and the writer is this man right here, Marshall Terrell. Marshall, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. No problem. And we will be right back.